Next up is George Harrell. George Harrell is a teacher with Kepler Education, where he teaches courses in American history as well as economics. His talk tonight is How to Create a Coup, How the 1953 Overthrow of Iran Became a CIA Blueprint. George. All right, good evening, everyone. It's great to be able to present here yet again. George Buchanan Forum and talk about the 1953 CIA coup in Iran. And I'm guessing that if most of you uh, have asked somebody to think about the history of U.S.-Iranian relations, they probably start with some sort of vague understanding that Iran was ruled probably back in the 70s by the U.S.-friendly Shah, who was then overthrown in the 1979 Iranian revolution that resulted in the Iran hostage crisis. All right, this is, this is the subject of like, the film Argo and the book it was based on. This is the Genesis story that we tell with the Garden of Eden resulting fall from grace that led to 40 going on now 50 years of tension between the US and Iran. If you ask an Iranian, the Genesis story tends to start earlier, back in the 1950s, with a period of positive US-Iranian relations under Mossadegh, and then a fall in 1953 with the CIA coup that overthrew him and installed the dictatorial regime of the Shah. And I mention this because there is a, uh, there's a, a recent book by historian John Gesvinian titled America and Iran, A History, 1720 to the Present, which, which I, I highly recommend to you. Um, and he explains in that book how both of these popular narratives focus far too much on the fall from Eden. And he does a phenomenal job describing why this is an inadequate way of telling our joint history and that in order to do our narratives justice, we really need to appreciate that the US and Iran have had a long mutual fascination and admiration for one another going all the way back into the 18th century. And I think reading that, you'd be really surprised just how much Americans and Iranians were genuinely interested in keeping up on one another's current events. So while yes, the topic I'm presenting on here tonight is on the 1953 coup, my interest in discussing this is not to reflect on Iranian-US relations, but rather to re-examine how we perceive the CIA and global events in light of CIA covert action. And then to look at the 1953 coup as a case study, because this one was really, this was the CIA's patient zero, if you will. And when I picked this topic to present on, it seemed pretty relevant considering the recent events of the past several years, but I had no idea that I'd be presenting it in the middle of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So the subject matter, especially that of foreign meddling and blowback, has taken on some fresh relevance. So as already mentioned, the US and Iran had a long history of interest and appreciation for one another. But it's not really until the 20th century that their paths began to politically overlap. In 1906, through the Constitutional Revolution, Iran was transformed from a near absolute monarchy into a constitutional one with a ruling Shah and a representational parliament known as the Majlis. However, both British and Russian imperialists felt threatened by Iran's attempt to establish itself as a legitimate representational government and for the next 50 years, these two empires would attempt to use the Shah as their puppet ruler, while the Iranian Majlis would try to establish political ties with the United States as a counterweight to Russian and British pressure. Then in 1914, with World War I looming on the horizon, the British, in possession of the world's largest navy that had just recently converted from coal to oil, were in search of a source of fuel to power their wartime needs. Winston Churchill, as the first Lord of the Admiralty, pushed the British government to purchase a controlling interest in the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. The original owners of the company had established themselves in Iran back in 1901, so prior to the Constitutional Revolution. And through bribery, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company had been granted a near complete monopoly over all drilling, refining, extracting, and selling of Iranian oil. When the British government purchased leading shares in the company, the Iranian government was contracted to receive just 16% of the net profits and royalties. 
But since no one other than the company itself was allowed to audit its books, no one knows exactly how much of that 16% was truly being paid. And then in addition to the 16% profit paid to the Iranian government, this was being calculated after the company had paid taxes on the oil to the British government. And since the company was now largely owned by the British government, this is basically a tax to itself. At this point, Iranian oil not only fueled the British Navy, but its sales also paid for the British Navy. And Churchill wrote that Iranian oil was, and I quote, a prize from fairyland beyond our wildest dreams. So throughout World War I, Iran unsuccessfully attempted to remain neutral. But Ottoman, British, and Russian soldiers in pursuit of oil battled over northern Iran, starting a famine that killed perhaps as many as two million people. When, 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 when World War I ended, Iran again attempted to remain out of European politics. But with the rise of Hitler, the same narrative played out again. In September of 1941, afraid that Hitler would swing Iran away from its neutral position, Churchill and Stalin conducted a preemptive joint invasion of Iran. The Shah was exiled, and the British replaced him with his more compliant 20-year-old son, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, who would become the last Shah of Iran. The claim at the time was that the Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran was not a colonial move, it was a wartime necessity, and that they would leave once the war was over. And they did. And when, but when the war ended and the Allies pulled their military forces out, they once again left behind a devastated and hostile country ruled over by a British puppet in the Shah, but with an anti-British Iranian parliament. World War II also left Britain bankrupt. And this was at the same time that the Labour Party rose to power. And they did so on a platform of widespread welfare programs, which, despite Britain's bankruptcy, was actually made possible in large part through the cheap importation and then exportation of Iranian oil being drilled by the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. Anglo-Iranian oil held the largest oil reserves and operated the largest oil refinery in the world at Abadan in the south of Iran. And author Stephen Kinzer notes that Quote, Britain's standard of living was supported by oil from Iran. British cars, trucks, and buses ran on cheap Iranian oil. Factories throughout Britain were fueled by oil from Iran, unquote. And meanwhile, in Iran, with the Shah's backing and protection, British oilmen became almost a subsidized Iranian aristocracy living in luxurious mansions, hanging out in private country clubs, and swimming pools, while Iranian workers lived in shanty towns without running water, electricity, or sewers, yet furthering the divide between the Shah and his people and the hostility that Iranians felt towards the British. But things were about to change when in 1950, over in Saudi Arabia, Aramco, known at the time as the Arabian American Oil Company, agreed to a 50-50 share of their profits with the Saudis. The British ambassador to Iran sent a cable to his government urging them to make a similar deal with the Iranian government, but the British Foreign Office refused. And then when the Iranian parliament requested that Anglo-Iranian oil open their books for transparency's sake, mm -hmm. the British government again curtly refused that as well. Tensions finally came to a head that next year when Iranian nationalists in the Iranian parliament voted in Mohammad Mosaddegh into power as the prime minister of Iran. And uh, Mosaddegh is a fascinating character. He was selected by Time magazine as the 1951 man of the year. And he was picked over Winston Churchill, Harry Truman, and Dwight Eisenhower. So, already an elderly statesman by the time he was elected prime minister. He previously served on the Iranian parliament was well respected for his political acumen. He had attended university in France and Switzerland, achieving a doctorate in law. And he was known for his passionate advocacy for Iranian democracy, sovereignty, and popular representation. But beyond being just an admired politician, he was also beloved by his fellow Iranians who saw him as a genuinely passionate and emotional leader who cared for their plight. 
he was also fervently opposed to the Anglo-Iranian oil company. In fact, Mossadegh only accepted his election as prime minister on the condition that the Majlis would vote on a bill that he had prepared to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And the Iranian parliament did so unanimously. The British government freaked out and declared that the proposed nationalization was illegal. But despite their claims that this was outrageous, Mossadegh was actually copying the British and was offering the Anglo-Iranian oil company almost the same level of compensation that the British had offered when they had just recently implemented the exact same process of nationalization over their own coal, uh, coal and steel industries. But Britain was having none of it. And so for the next two years, they threatened basically every level of political and legal action against Iran. And at the same time, they also attempted more strong-armed tactics, imposing sanctions and threatening war, actually mobilizing in preparation for invading Iran. The British had an impressive network of spies and informants throughout the country, and they busied themselves bribing government officials, spreading misinformation about Mossadegh, trying to separate him from his constituency while working to align the Shah with Anglo-Iranian oil interests. However, US President Harry Truman absolutely refused to allow the British to engage in an invasion of Iran. And Truman genuinely seems to have attempted to take an honest third party role in all of this and tried to help Iran and Britain reach some sort of agreement. But the British only felt betrayed and frustrated by what seemed to be American apathy to the concerns of British imperialism. When the British declared that they wanted to bring the matter to the UN Security Council, the US government warned the British that this would bring a spotlight to the situation and undoubtedly reflect poorly on the British. Mossadegh, however, responded with enthusiasm and flew to New York to personally present his case. In New York, Mossadegh caused a media sensation. He appeared on American TV, comparing the nationalization of the British oil company to the American Revolution. He made such an impression that the Security Council refused to accept the British resolution. It was the first major uh, defeat for British resolution in the history of the UN. Mossadegh was then asked by Truman to come to Washington and to discuss a compromise with the British oil company, but the British refused any. After their defeat at the Security Council, the British resolved the only answer left to them was to overthrow Mossadegh. British agents immediately began to implement plans for a coup. But when Mossadegh caught wind of the plot, he acted quickly. He closed the British embassy, and sent all the British diplomats home, which included the agents plotting the coup. And without their agents in Iran, the British were left without any response to the nationalization. <clears throat> Churchill, now 77 years old, appealed to President Truman for assistance, even threatening to pull British troops out of Korea if America didn't help. Truman turned him down and said that neither he nor the CIA would be involved in overthrowing the government of Iran. And Truman had privately he expressed concern about the power of the CIA, warning of the possibility of the CIA growing into a, quote, American Gestapo. But the CIA was a young organization chomping at the bit for an opportunity to prove its worth on the world stage. And starting in February of 1953, without the White House's approval or knowledge, the British Secret Intelligence Service reached out to Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, and through him began pumping over 1 million US dollars into Iran to overthrow Mossadegh as part of the CIA named Operation Ajax. And by this point, Truman was now out of office, replaced by Dwight Eisenhower, who was the first Republican president in 20 years. He'd come to power on a hardline anti-Soviet, anti-communist platform, and the British believed that this was a tool that they could use, and immediately sent their former chief of the British intelligence station from Tehran to meet with Eisenhower. And rather than make a legal argument for British control over the Anglo-Iranian oil company as they had previously, his stated goal was to stoke fear that Iran was going communist. On March 4th, 
CIA Director Alan Dulles met with Eisenhower and tried to sell the notion that Iran was at risk of falling to the communists in a revolution, which if he claimed, if successful, uh, would be disastrous for oil prices. Eisenhower was unimpressed and unconvinced. The British then suggested that Dulles change tack, and instead of claiming that Mossadegh and Iran were going to join the Soviets, instead claimed that instability inside Iran caused by Mossadegh's mishandling of the oil crisis would lead to destabilization and a Soviet invasion. And in fact, in the face of British sanctions, Iran was beginning to demonstrate signs of economic peril. By threatening other European countries, Britain had effectively managed to strangle all Iranian attempts to sell their oil on the world market, which was their one big export. But Eisenhower remained reluctant. Over the next several months, the CIA and British intelligence worked out an agreement whereby the CIA and British would jointly plan the coup using the intelligence collected by the British agents that had worked in Iran, while the CIA would execute the plan. The CIA selected Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, to sneak into Iran and lead the coup. And he reported directly back to Frank Wisner at CIA headquarters. Then finally, on July 11th, Eisenhower gave the CIA the go-ahead, and the coup was off. Mossadegh, worried that the British were plotting something, was actually even now in the process of reaching out to the U.S. to request military support, when he suddenly found himself, much to his surprise and horror, cut off from his American contacts. And meanwhile, Kermit Roosevelt was sneaking back and forth into the palace, wrapped in a blanket in the backseat of a car, meeting secretly with the Shah to secure his support for the coup. But the Shah was terrified of being discovered plotting with Roosevelt. And despite supporting the coup in theory, he refused to become an active participant in it. But after two weeks of pressure from Roosevelt and the US military, the Shah finally buckled. And on August 12th, with a signed decree from the Shah dismissing Mossadegh as prime minister, Roosevelt believed that the coup was ready. The dismissal was actually of zero legal value, however, since only parliament could dismiss the Shah, but Roosevelt wasn't interested in the legal details. His plan was that when the decree was delivered personally to Mossadegh, Mossadegh would refuse to leave office, and he would then be arrested by the officer delivering the message. At the same time, a bribed Iranian general, Zahidi, would use the Iranian military to seize control of the country, and the Shah would declare Zahidi the new prime minister. But first, Roosevelt had to cook up a reason for Mossadegh to be dismissed. The first step to his plan was to create the appearance of chaos. Bribed Iranian newspaper editors and columnists published articles denouncing Mossadegh as a communist and a Jew bribed members of the Iranian parliament and influential leaders within Mossadegh's own political party were encouraged to distance themselves from him. Roosevelt paid Iranian military officials to take orders from Zahidi following Mossadegh's arrest. Mullahs were bribed to preach that Mossadegh was anti-Islamic and an atheist, and while at the same time, Roosevelt bought thugs to masquerade as members of the communist two-day party and began rioting in the streets, attacking mullahs and mosques. Mossadegh, unaware that the CIA was behind the coup, hit back. He dismissed the parliament, mobilized the military, and on the night of August 15th, when the Shah's imperial guardsmen went to Mossadegh's house to deliver the royal dismissal and arrest Mossadegh, they were shocked to find themselves surrounded by troops loyal to Mossadegh and were themselves arrested. The coup collapsed. General Saidi went to hiding at a CIA safe house. Shah fled the country in a private plane. Alan Dulles was vacationing in Europe, unaware that the coup had failed. And Frank Weisner, hearing that Mossadegh's secret police were arresting the plotters, on August 16th, Weisner declared the coup a failure and ordered the Tehran office to cease operations, urgently messaging Roosevelt to leave the country. Kermit Roosevelt refused. Determined to finish the job that he had started, Roosevelt set about creating a second coup just hours after the previous plan had failed, a plan that the CIA and British officials had taken weeks to prepare. The US ambassador in Iran 
was told to give the Shah a script to read publicly, declaring that he had been forced to flee in the face of a left-wing uprising. And Roosevelt then gave $50,000 to his Iranian agents to buy a mob of rioters to chant communist slogans while smashing up the streets of Tehran. Initially, real communist members of the two-day party joined in, but at some point, even they realized that the whole event was staged, and according to a CIA station report, they, quote, tried to argue demonstrators into going home, unquote. Over the next several days, Kermit Roosevelt used all the money at his disposal to hire more and more street gang leaders to attack government buildings. And he then ferried in people from outside Tehran on buses and trucks to then attack those rioters. Directing his agents from his safe house in Tehran, Roosevelt used bribed military troops to attack the telegraph office, the propaganda ministry, and police and army headquarters. Soon the CIA were in control of Radio Tehran and began broadcasting. Mossadegh, worried how it would be interpreted, uh, and refused to order the military to attack the rioters. But when he finally did, it was too late. Several hundred people died in street battles in Tehran and outside Mossadegh's home as CIA-controlled Imperial Guards assaulted with artillery and tanks the troops stationed there. And by midnight of August 19th, Mossadegh's house was in flames and he was forced to flee. The next day, he surrendered himself to pro-Shah forces. And he would spend the next three years in prison and live out the rest of his life under house arrest. Roosevelt then gave $1 million to General Zahidi with orders to militarily seize control of the country and mop up the remaining resistance. The Shah, completely unaware that the coup was still going on, was sitting at a restaurant in Rome when a news correspondent burst in to announce that he was being called to return to the throne. When he had recovered from his shock, he told the people gathered around him, I knew it, they love me. <laughs> He flew back to Tehran a few days later, and on the last night that Kermit Roosevelt spent in Iran, they met for the first time publicly. Over a glass of vodka, the Shah toasted Roosevelt, saying, I owe my throne to God, my people, my army, and you. Kermit Roosevelt returned to Washington and gave a briefing at the White House, and Eisenhower pinned the National Security Medal on Roosevelt for his role in the coup. So this coup had a profound effect on the future of the CIA, future of Iran, the Middle East, and the Cold War. And the event was described by a State Department official as, quote, the CIA's greatest single triumph. It was trumpeted as a great American national victory. We had changed the whole course of a country here, unquote. And it gave the CIA a much needed boost to their legitimacy as a covert wing of US foreign policy when their role up to that point was fairly uncertain. And in fact, just a few days later, Roosevelt was called into Dulles's office and asked if he would replicate his coup, but this time against the democratically elected president of Guatemala. Roosevelt turned the opportunity down but the CIA found a replacement and within a year used the tactics that they had learned in Iran to successfully depose President Arbenz in an act that would eventually lead to a 30 year long civil war in Guatemala and the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Guatemalans. Following Guatemala, the CIA then attempted to replicate this with varying success against the governments of Indonesia, Chile, Cuba, Vietnam, and the Congo. And these are just the ones we know about. Meanwhile, back in Iran, the Shah would rule for the next 26 years. And so long as he was in power, the CIA deemed the coup to have been a rousing success. The Shah became a loyal US ally and tool of the CIA, communicating with the American government, not through the US ambassador's office, but through the CIA station chief in Tehran. The Shah became the US's largest arm purchaser. And even as he ended popular representation in Iran and became an increasingly brutal and tyrannical dictator, Cold War politics meant the US gave him complete public support while keeping their criticisms private. And so for years, the Iranian public 
increasingly grew to hate both the puppet and the puppet master. And the term blowback, which if you've heard of, that was coined actually by the CIA to describe their fears of potential unintended consequences from the 1953 coup. And this blowback did eventually occur in the Iranian Revolution that led to the overthrow of the Shah and the rise of the equally oppressive Ayatollah. And although we mostly remember the revolution for the American hostage situation, uh, on that note, it's worth pointing out that the Iranians attacked the US embassy several months after the revolution had ended, out of fear that the CIA was plotting a counter coup to return the Shah to power. The Iranian Revolution and the resulting Islamic Republic and then sparked similar nationalist movements calling for the end of the colonial monarchies in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Syria, and Lebanon in favor of Islamic republics. And it also led the Ayatollah in Iran to ally with more diverse anti-American and British movements, including the Palestinian Liberation Organization Against Israel, the IRA in Northern Ireland, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and also the Afghan Mujahideen, where the Taliban rose up, ironically, thanks to CIA arms and money and a CIA attempt to overthrow the Soviet-supported Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. So knowing this information opens a bunch of questions, not least of which is how do we approach the narratives being fed to us by our government through the mainstream media concerning issues both foreign and domestic, especially when we have unelected branches of the government such as the CIA operating and creating foreign policy with no oversight and no transparency. The CIA's lack of transparency leaves us in an awkward position of being unable to prove or disprove CIA claims unless they volunteer to make their documents public, or we have a whistleblower, or someone just leaks the information. And this is exactly what happened with the 1953 coup in Iran. For near 60 years, we had little to prove CIA involvement. And in fact, the day after the coup, the New York Times was reporting that what had happened was that the Shah had successfully thwarted a coup attempt by Mossadegh. And it wasn't until 1979, when Kermit Roosevelt published his memoirs on the coup, that we had any solid narrative contrary to the official one. And then in 2000, the New York Times published some documents from the State Department on the subject. And then finally, Obama released a 70-page internal report on the coup written by the CIA. So, None of the story that I've told here is secret occult knowledge, and it's all completely available to the public and has even been published on in numerous popular historical works. And so you know, what are we to make of the CIA based on the doc documentation that they have made publicly available? And all you need to do is take a quick look through their files to see that they are not a branch of some monolithic American foreign policy but rather an organization run by individuals whose personal interests from day one have often been completely at odds with Republican virtue, popular representation, keeping Americans safe, or whatever it else it is that conservatives value. And yet, somehow, Americans are generally blissfully unaware of our governmental institutions having committed any wrongdoing and view the world through the lens of it all began when he hit me back. And when presented with evidence to the contrary, they respond as Jimmy Carter did in 1980 when asked if Iranian hostility towards the US had anything to do with the 1953 coup and he replied that that was quote unquote ancient history. <laughs> And this level of forgetfulness and willful ignorance extends right up into current events. So everyone is currently rushing to give their two cents on the war in Ukraine. Why should I be any different? But what the heck is going on in there? And whatever it is, we need to learn to move beyond the simplistic thinking that says Ukraine and NATO good, Putin bad. Has the CIA been involved in escalating the crisis in Ukraine? 
short of a smoking gun, what we have to go on is the knowledge that over the past 20 years, there have been nearly a dozen anti-Russian coups in the countries surrounding Russia, including Yugoslavia in 2000, Georgia in 2003, Ukraine in 2004, Belarus and Tajikistan in 2005, Ukraine again in 2014, and then most recently, the attempted coup last year in Belarus, and the one a few months back in Kazakhstan. Do these have CIA fingerprints on them? Putin says they do. But the Russian dictatorship obviously can't be trusted. But neither can we trust the CIA, who's busy telling us that these are organic democratic movements. Again, unless a whistleblower leaks something proving CIA involvement, and we do have some very damning leaked evidence, short of that, we'll just have to wait 60 years for the CIA to tell us. Um, but in the meantime, what is our gut reactions? When we hear claims that Venezuela is attacking American aid convoys, that Iran is attacking British oil tankers in the Gulf, Assad is gassing his own people, or that Iraq has WMDs. As time has gone on, and we've started to collect a historical track record on similar flashpoints from the past, such as the 1953 coup, there is one thing that we can know. And that is that we have zero reason to trust retired Pentagon officials on the payroll of the defense industry when they are rolled out on mainstream news as experts to tell us that no one in the US government did anything to provoke this latest unexplained act of aggression by a foreign power. And the more we know, the more we discover that these are not the battles of good versus bad. They are the conflicts of bad versus worse with innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. And in the current state of affairs, with the blatant propaganda and push for simplistic binary thinking, we would do well to remember the words of the documentarian Albert Maisel's that tyranny is the deliberate removal of nuance. Thank you. <laughs>